Good morning. The time is now 9.31 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of August 10th, 2021 is called to order. First item on the agenda is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Yeah. Mr. McMillan? Um, I have a resolution. I have three resolutions. I emailed everybody. Um, I'd like to take them individually and um, make a motion to add them to the agenda. Um, it would be... My, my amendment to the agenda would be to add item 8L after K. So after 8L, um, I would m move that we add what everybody has received in their emails. And I have copies here, uh, the anti-mask mandate resolution. Um, and uh, I would move that we add that to the agenda. If you have copy, if, if, uh, we have a motion and a second on the uh, floor. If you could distribute copies okay. to um, people, that would be great. I did not receive a copy. Okay. Did any other board member receive a copy? They were in the re your email. Just a couple of minutes ago. A couple of minutes yeah, ago. Okay, haven't. thank you very much. So we have a motion and a second to include. I thought you said three resolutions. Well, no, I there's one. Two. The anti-mask mandate resolution is the first one that I'm making a, a motion. Mm -hmm. That's my amendment. So your amendment is to do these individually? I'm doing this one first. Okay, very good. I heard that you were wanted to put three on the agenda. The motion and I believe the second for Ms. Snyder is to uh, place an anti-mask mandate resolution, which has been presented to the board in the last few minutes. Uh, on the um, on the agenda, any discussion? Any discussion? Yes. I, um, you know, we've we've done uh, resolutions, you know, on the fly many times uh, since I've been here. So I mean, it's this people would have if if you want to put this on the agenda, which I think is important. You have many many hours before it would be addressed. So there's plenty of time uh, to address it. Um, and like I said, we've certainly had resolutions that we didn't know were coming and showed up um, in the past. Um, so I, I just think that this is important, uh, you know, to make it so that, you know, people know, districts know that we, you know, really oppose uh, masking children. I mean, it's just, uh, we know the CDC uh, says that, you know, they're more likely to get killed in a car accident than um, from COVID children. Uh, we know that anybody who wanted a COVID vaccine has plenty of time and can and can get it. School staff, family members, and we know the importance of facial expression during, uh, you know, of of students and and being able to see teachers and everything like that. So we know the importance of um, not wearing masks. It's really harmful to children. We know that, and we know it's unnecessary that they have masks. So I just think this is important, and uh, that's why I'm supporting that we put it on the agenda um, and then can discuss it at that point if Thank we you. want. Thank you very much. President Ulbrich, uh, Ms. Lipton for a question, and Dr. Pugh. So uh, I appreciate that sometimes things come up uh, out of the blue last minute, and sometimes we have to be a little flexible with that, but this clearly is not out of the blue. Um, and this is why I've requested that we have board norms because uh, this should not be coming to us minutes before the board meeting and asking us to add to this to the agenda. And the other thing I would say is right now what we should be debating is whether or not to add it to the agenda, not debating the actual right. uh, resolution itself. Right. Yep, okay. I agree. Very good. So we have uh, Ms. Lipton with a question on the telephone um, and then Dr. Pugh and Ms. Snyder. Ms. Lipton. Yes, thank you. Um, I do have a question um, and observation. Since I've been on the board, I'm not aware of um, the necessity of, uh, I do recall one other situation where something was presented on the fly, so to speak. And um, I do believe as a matter of um, just um, procedure and norms, I thought we had had a discussion about giving members something like 24 hours ahead of time. I know that our board norms haven't been incorporated yet, but I do recall a discussion um, at least 
giving people um, some advance notice. Um, I received this at 922 um, for a 931 um, call. Um, and uh, so I just, um, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned that we're not even trying to incorporate some good practices um, in, uh, in, in how we deliver information. And, and certainly, we are a public body, and I, I do believe we do need to give the public consideration as well. Um, and so uh, I, I do feel that even bringing such a motion is, is uh, or to, I'm sorry, not uh, even bringing forth the, the notion of amending on the fly at this is, is just very problematic for a, for a public body. Um, and I would just encourage um, us all to think very carefully about norms and, and adhering to, to rules. Otherwise, we simply are a body of chaos. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Dr. Pugh, Ms. Snyder. Um, I am in total opposition to this, but I, 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 I'm okay with you putting it on the agenda because um, I think that is, it is an urgent issue. And I think that it then gives me the opportunity to put something totally in opposition to this on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Dr. Pugh, Ms. Snyder. A few things. Alan, it's nice to see your face. Technology works. Um, it's nice to see our ability to have a hybrid meeting like this. It's, it's very neat. Um, I think it opens up possibilities as we move forward and hash all of these things out. Um, but one of the things that's been said is process and procedural. We have said at this board and created statements, I mean, quite literally, just, you know, talking back and forth and, and editing things and put the, putting them out. So whether you got it at 9 a.m. or you have a lunch to think it over, or even Pam just said, I'm in complete opposition, and I'll make that clear. Um, I think we can get through the process, um, even if we don't necessarily agree on these board norms. So the other thing I would say is that I met with the Michigan School of Deaf and Hard and Hearing this last summer, and I definitely would encourage us to vote to put it on the agenda to discuss it because that school is very frustrated with mask mandates. They're not able to learn ASL effectively or have access to a good education when they can't see full facial expression. So you have school districts out there desperately in need for this discussion. And I would, I would just urge us to at least put it on the agenda and think about um, the full breadth of our actions today as we move forward. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Dr. Pugh, to you. I was just going to say, to, to President Albrecht's uh, point, we're not discussing the item. We're just it is not the it. substance yeah. of, the, um, of the resolution. It is whether or not the resolution uh, gets on the agenda initially, it would then be placed on the agenda, and would be separately discussed. That's correct. Other, uh, other board members for um, comments? thoughts, considerations, concerns about the placement of the item on the agenda, not the substance thereof, but the placement of the item on the agenda. Hearing and seeing none, Marilyn, roll call vote, please. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Tilly? Yes. Yes. Average. No. 6 2, motion carries. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman McMillan. I have a motion to add as a number 8M uh, anti student vaccine mandate resolution uh, that everybody has. Um, I think it's important. And, and the reason these three I think are important is because school starts in many areas before we meet again. So I think. Um, you know, it's good to let them know, you know, what what the position of the board is, at least. Um, and I, you know, I think I'm talking in here um, about opposing discriminating against students, including masking, penalties, quarantines, and segregation based on vaccine status. And uh, I think it's a good uh, issue that we should take up um, for 8M. Okay, so, second. We second that so, motion. so we have a motion, we have a second, any discussion? Um, discussion on the placement of 
the resolution on the agenda, not the substance thereof, but the placement of the resolution on the agenda. Hearing and seeing none, Marilyn, please, a roll call vote. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? No. 6 2, motion carries. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, um, resolution to end the re uh, as uh, 8N, as in Nancy, a resolution to end the requirement of medical testing by schools and in schools. And, uh, and uh, Nikki had drafted this, but uh, I think, again, this is something that uh, is going to come up. Uh, and is coming up, and so I think that there's uh, there's an interest. I don't know if you want. I is there support? Yeah. I'll, I'll second that. Motion. Okay. It, uh, is this something um, uh, to which we're privy? Yes. Do we have copies. Yes. Yeah. Could I please be given a copy? Sure. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry. Could you please distribute to other board members yep. as well? Yep. We're any of this. Thank you. Thank you. The motion on the table, board. Uh, from Mr. McMillan, seconded by Ms. Snyder, is for a resolution to end the requirement of medical testing by schools and in schools. Again, it's not a vote on the substance. It is a vote on whether or not the resolution will be placed on the agenda. Um, so we have a motion. We have a second. Discussion. Uh, President Albrecht. Ellen has a question. I beg your pardon. Uh, Ms. Lipton. Yes. Um, again, I... I would like to reiterate that um, the, the request to put this on the agenda approximately six minutes before the start of the meeting um, I do think is problematic. And the question that I have for either of the makers would be, um, can you elucidate to the rest of the board the need or the... the um, the inability to provide, I think we discussed 24 hours notice um, before the motion. I would just, I'm just curious, certainly as we work through board norms, uh, I certainly want to be sensitive to the need for, as you stated, on the fly resolutions. And again, bear with me, I understand that there were perhaps situations that arose before. Uh, myself and uh, board member Strayhorn came on the board, but at least um, uh, in terms of my tenure on the board, the discussion has been uh, with some thought toward adhering to uh, processes and practices. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I tend to be um, somewhat a lover of of rules um, and uh, and norms, because I do believe that um, a democracy works well when it's bound by rules. Um, and so if you could just please help educate me as to what extenuating circumstances, if any, resulted in the need to present this to the board, as I said, approximately six minutes before the start of the board would be extremely helpful. I don't have a problem, Mr. Chairman. If, you, if the bylaws didn't allow it, I wouldn't do it. Um, and we certainly have a history of, of presenting resolutions. I could have waited, I guess, until 3 o'clock. I figured it'd be good for everybody to, you know, these are very simple, straightforward resolutions, whether, you know, um, and so, you know, I, I think that, um, the, and, and quite frankly, we were, you know, I was still working on it. I wasn't sure that I was going to present these. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's important. Um, and that's why uh, I'm giving you plenty of time to look at them. <laughs> I mean, the, you'll uh, have till two or three o'clock. Uh, Ms. Lipton, another uh, so, another question or comment? So I just want to make sure I understand what I heard, um, so that the that so that because the current bylaws permit it, it was done. Um, I think that's what I heard you say. Number one and number two. Um, because you were still working on it up until three or so in the morning. So those were the, the circumstances that surrounded be, us being presented. And thirdly, that you felt that six minutes was enough time. 
um, because of the simplicity of the resolution. I just want to make sure I understand the answer to my question. Did I did I no. did I understand that correctly? No, Mr. Oh. McMill. Uh, excuse me, Mr. McMillan, a clarification, and then Ms. Snyder. Oh, I wasn't up till three o'clock on this. So. Okay, all right. So the, okay, clar the clarification was that that uh, Mr. McMillan was not up until three in the morning. Ms. Snyder. We'll try to table the facetiousness because I think that would be helpful in making sure that we can honor each other in the discussion. But I think right now one of the biggest issues with these uh, proposals is that we're in the middle of an ongoing pandemic. We have local school districts who have or have not um, communicated what they plan to do. In the next three and a half weeks, we have some school districts, like I just mentioned, with the Michigan School of Deaf that... Uh, haven't communicated at all to their parents. Um, for us to be leaders and to step up and to consider that, I think is an important thing to do, so it's on the table. Uh, my local school district didn't email us with any related um, information about these proposals maybe in the last 72 hours. And so to think it through, to give it time, to come up with something of substance, um, the timing may not feel right to you, but the timing of all things considered have been just chaotic and confusing throughout this entire experience working through a pandemic together. We have the entire meeting to talk about these topics here and there, uh, bite them off, dig into them more. I think it's, it's worth considering. Not because Tom and Nikki stayed up till 3 a.m. and tried to do something to slip it in there, but because the students of the state of Michigan need this guidance and leadership. So I, I still urge us to put it on the table and have a strong discussion about it. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Snyder. Other, uh, other board members, comments, questions, reflections on the placement of the resolution on the agenda, not the substance thereof, but the placement of the item on the agenda. Hearing and seeing uh, none, uh, Marilyn, if we could uh, please do a roll call vote. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albridge? No. 6-2 motion carries. Thank you very much. Any other uh, reflections on the agenda at this time? If not, those are I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Pugh. Um, and I do apologize um, uh, to your point, Ellen. I, I do feel that this is a very critical issue. So um, since Tom has started this uh, ball to rolling, uh, I would like to uh, propose that we place on the agenda a mass mandate resolution, um, a requirement for, for medical testing by schools and in schools, and um, a vaccine resolution that, that speaks to the CDC's guidance. Do we Should have, I go one by one? Uh, please. Okay, I will start with the mass mandate resolution. You want to, to share the language? resolution? I do not have language. Okay, so um, do you care to flesh that out now or do you care to share it later? Uh, how would you like to work this? I would like, um, I think in the past, the way that we did it, and I know that we've had lots of conversations about how we put these items on the agenda but in the past, the way that we did this, it would have come up at a legislative, during legislative discussion. And so I'm willing to have that conversation during legislative discussion as to how we proceed with how we do that. But I do think that it is critical. And I was going to bring up mass mandate. I would have did it a little bit differently. But since this is how my fellow board members have brought these subjects forward, I would like to um, um, put forward uh, science-based um, facts for putting forward a mask mandate. And so if someone wants to suggest how that's done, um, whether it's an agenda item or if we put it on during uh, the legislative discussion, I'm, I'm open to that. Fair enough. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Dr. Albridge. Can I suggest that since we now have these three items added to our agenda, that instead of adding additional items to the agenda, that perhaps this is a rewrite of the, um, 
the uh, statements that have been presented Absolutely. and therefore can just follow with Absolutely. the current agenda. Mm -hmm. so that makes sense. So you mean like I could take anti off of anti mask mandate, anti off of mm -hmm. an end out of requirement? We have certainly um, edited statements. Okay. Uh, in I'm the past, at yep. the board table. I'm good with that. That makes perfect sense. It makes it easier. So is that is that a uh, a motion to add something for discussion under state and federal update, or is that a uh, a formal motion on the table? I re I think I can rescind yeah. my yeah, motion, we'll and mm -hmm. then we'll the just have the fair enough. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Any other uh, reflections um, on the uh, the setting of the agenda? Um, hearing and seeing none, if we could have a, uh, a motion to approve the agenda as amended with the three items added, added as discussion slash action items under 13. Oh, 13, not 8, I'm sorry. That's right. Yeah. Um, can I have a motion, motion please? To yeah, motion, motion to approve, motion, uh, motion amended, to approve yes. the amended agenda. With the three resolutions added. 13 LM and We've got a motion to approve by Mr. McMillan. Do I have a second? Second. A second for Dr. Pritchett. Um, any discussion? Hearing none. Roll call vote. Clarify, actually, yes. Um, so we're, we'll be voting on six separate items. Yes? No, three. No. Three. Okay. There, there are three separate items that have been added to the agenda. There are already two items under that section now. Understood. The two and the three, the five. Um, in total, Dr. Pugh has rescinded her um, her request for a motion. I, I do have yeah. a clarifying question, though. Please, if uh, let's say that uh, Tom McMillan makes the motion for the current statement, and Nikki Snyder seconds it, and then Pam offers a uh, amendment. We get to vote on that amendment, right? It doesn't have to. If the makers of the motion say, "I don't accept that," that it doesn't die there, right? You can you, you can vote on the amendment. Right. The amendment uh, goes okay. up or down, yep. and then it is incorporated or not right. based okay. on that vote. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so I have a motion. I have a second. At the end of the discussion, roll call vote <laughs> on the agenda. Lipton. Yes. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Pew. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Strayhorn. Yes. Tilly. Yes. Albrich. Yes. Eight all motion carries unanimous. Thank you very much, Marilyn. At this time, Marilyn uh, Schneider, our State Board Executive, will introduce the members of the State Board of Education who are uh, already voluble this morning. Good morning. We have um, Dr. Rice, who serves as the chairman of the board. He's the state superintendent, and he's seated at the end of the table. The president of the board, as we go around, is Cassandra Albrich, waving to you. She's president <laughs> of the board from Dearborn. Dr. Pamela Pugh, vice president from Saginaw. Tiffany Tilly is joining us virtually. Um, the Open Meetings Act does allow for participation and voting virtually due to a medical condition, and that is what is being used with her virtual participation. She's from Southfield. Tom McMillan is, well, I'm not going around the table anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back in my virtual mode. My apologies. Ms. Nikki Snyder is on the board's legislative committee. She's from Dexter. She is in the room. And today, also in the room, is the Michigan Teacher of the Year who is currently serving, Owen Bondano, and he's usually teaching ninth graders in Oak Park. As we go across the table, this is the governor's representative, Patricia Redinger. She is joining us from Washington, D.C., virtually. She's ex officio member of the board uh, representing the governor. And as we keep coming around the table, in the room, Judy Pritchett, Dr. Judith Pritchett. She's the NASB delegate and state board legislative committee member from Washington Township, Michigan. NASB is the board's um, association, National Associations of State Boards of Education, and she represents the board on that 
Um, next to her is Jason Strayhorn. He's legislative committee member from Novi. He is present in the room. Next to me is Tom McMillan, and he is the treasurer from Oakland Township. He's with me in the room, and Ellen, I did not introduce Ellen Cogen Lipton yet. She's chair of the board's legislative committee from Huntington Woods. She is joining us virtually. She is allowed to join us virtually by reason of a medical condition. This is in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Sue Carnell, our new chief deputy superintendent. She is replacing uh, Sheila Alice. Uh, Dr. Carnell, formerly chief of staff to the state superintendent, formerly an urban superintendent. She's not able to be here uh, today uh, because of her own medical appointment. Dr. Delsa Chapman is our new Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student, and School Supports, formerly Deputy Superintendent with the Lansing School District. Uh, Dr. Chapman, if you could stand and do a Queen's Way for us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good to have you. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's terrific. I'm, I'm clearly not good with the Queen's Way. Um, and Mr. Mark Howe, Chief of Staff to the State Superintendent, formerly Chief of Staff to the Chief Deputy Superintendent. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Howe, if you could uh, get up and do your version of, of that wave. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Good to, uh, good to have um, our new uh, people with us. Um, we do have, uh, we're, we're fortunate to have um, um, our Teachers of the Year here today, but before we get to um, our Regional Teachers of the Year, there are two resolutions that require approval before we move to presentations. These are a resolution honoring the 2020-2021 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Owen Bondano, and a resolution honoring the 2021-2022 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Leah Porter. May I please have a motion to approve the resolutions? So moved. I have a motion second. and a second. Uh, do I have any discussion? Hearing none. Marilyn, will you please take the roll, a roll call vote? Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. 8 0 motion carries unanimous. Thank you very much. Owen Bondano is the 2020 2021 Michigan Teacher of the Year. He's a high school English teacher at Oak Park High School, ninth grade learning community in Oak Park Schools. Um, we are delighted to have him in person this year, like so much <laughs> last year. Uh, the in-person nature of our board meetings, the absence of in-person board meetings was a, was a tremendous challenge. We appreciate, we feel like we know you because of meeting with you so many times virtually. It's a pleasure to, to meet you in person. Uh, Mr. Bondano has been a valuable resource during this unprecedented time. He's a passionate advocate for teachers and students. We thank Owen for his dedication and contributions to the teaching profession. Mr. Bondano will share um, his final remarks. Thank you. Um, I told all my students at the end of the year last year, um, they're high school students, so none of them ever turn their cameras on. Um, and so I told them that when they're 10th graders and they come to visit me, the first thing they have to do is say, uh, Mr. Bondano, hi, it's, and then tell me their name. And I, I, one of the students said, is it weird that you've been teaching us all year and we, you don't really know our faces? And I told him, yeah, because over the course of a year, of course, I've come to love you deeply and care about you, and I've come to know you so deeply, but if I passed you on the street, I wouldn't know you. Um, <laughs> and so they all promised that when they came to visit me, the first things out of their mouths would be their names, um, so that nobody would get embarrassed, but uh, especially me. Obviously, we didn't have the problem of cameras off in this particular meeting, uh, all through our virtual lives this past year, but it does still feel strange that we're all in three dimensions, most of us. Um, that we're all in the same room. I've been so honored to serve as a member of this board for the past year. Um, I am a teacher from a family of teachers who knows very much the humble and long work that, that is teaching um, and does not expect praise for it. To, um, uh, to quote Hamilton, teaching is planting a seed in a garden you never get to see. And to have spent a year getting to see the fruit of so many seeds has been a remarkable opportunity, and I cannot thank you enough for it. 
and I'm getting emotional now. <laughs> so uh, I know that I am leaving you with an excellent new board member for the year to come. Uh, Leah is amazing, and you're going to have a great time learning from her, all kinds of things that are different from what you learned from me, and I hope you are just as wonderful to her. I know you will be as you were to me. Um, so I, I thank you a million times, and, um, and it was so nice to actually see you in three dimensions before my, my year was over. Um, keep doing the work you do, and I'll do the work I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, board on May 13th, during a virtual meeting with the 2021-2022 Regional Teachers of the Year, Dr. Judy Pritchett and I made a surprise announcement, naming Ms. Leah Porter as the 2021-2022 Michigan Teacher of the Year. We were joined by President Cassandra Ulbrich and Board Member Ellen Cogan Lipton. Dr. Pritchett represented the board as a member of the Selection Committee. Ms. Leah Porter is a longtime kindergarten teacher who's moving to third grade this year at Wilcox Elementary School in Holt Public Schools. She was selected for more than 275 nominees statewide. This presentation will be facilitated by Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent of Educator Student and School Supports, Ms. Leah Breen, Director of the Office of Educator Excellence, and Ms. Jennifer Robel, Manager of the Recruitment and Recognition Unit in the Office of Educator Excellence. Uh, presenters, welcome. Good morning, board members. Good morning, new board members. Nice to meet you. <coughs> My name is Jennifer Robo. I'm the manager of the Recruitment and Recognition Unit in the Office of Educator Excellence. Oh. Oh. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the program, and then we'll watch a video, and then Ms. Porter will present her PowerPoint for you. The Michigan Teacher of the Year program, organized by the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Educator Excellence, and sponsored by the Munich Education Foundation, identifies exceptional teachers in our state, recognizes their effective work in the classroom, amplifies their voice, and empowers them to participate in policy discussions at the state level. Teachers are recognized both regionally and at, statewide, and at the statewide level. Regional Teachers of the Year and the Michigan Teacher of the Year comprise the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, and serve as invaluable resource to Michigan Department of Education and other state education stakeholders by representing the views of teachers in important policy discussions. In addition to serving as the head of the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, the Michigan Teacher of the Year represents Michigan teachers at national events organized by the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the Michigan Teacher of the Year is Michigan's candidate for the National Teacher of the Year Award. Also, uh, the Michigan Teacher of the Year serves on the Governor's Education Council. The R Toys and M Toy were selected following a multi level process that began with more than 275 total nominations this year and 79 applicants for Part A. So now let's watch the video of when Ms. Porter was announced. This is a day to celebrate outstanding teachers. I welcome and salute the 10 regional teachers of the year and their administrators. You are difference makers in the lives of our children. The Michigan Teacher of the Year program is not about finding the best teacher, an impossible task. Instead, it's about celebrating an outstanding member of the teaching profession and about giving Michigan teachers a voice at the state level. And now to announce the next Michigan Teacher of the Year, let me introduce Dr. Judy Pritchett, member of the State Board of Education, longtime Michigan educator, and member of the Michigan Teacher of the Year Selection Committee. Dr. Pritchett, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Congratulations again to all 10 of our Regional Teachers of the Year. It was my pleasure and privilege to be able to be part of the team that um, was able to learn a little bit more about you, both personally and about how you interact uh, and work with your students every day. As Dr. Rice has indicated, you all are very, very special and you are impacting your students 
every minute of every day, even when you're not with them. But it is now my distinct privilege and honor to announce that Leah Porter is our 2021-22 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. Congratulations, Leah. Leah is a kindergarten teacher at Wilcox Elementary in the whole public school district. Um, so Leah, would you like to turn on your mic and uh, share a few thoughts with us? Leah Porter has been chosen as the Michigan Teacher of the Year. I'm so sorry, my building just announced it across the, <laughs> the, the building, so I was waiting to unmute until that was over, so I apologize. You know, I, uh, I'm just really overwhelmed and uh, it's an honor, but also I just know that the cohort of teachers that were nominated as Regional Teachers of the Year as well, I'm just so excited that we'll be able to use all of the fantastic qualities I know that they all bring forth in the classroom to work together to do great work this year for the state of Michigan. gentlemen this is Leah Porter she's Hello. the new teacher of the year and she is going to give her PowerPoint presentation um, right now. gosh I have a couple of things for me over there we just have a few notes we're still back in person with people giving a presentation just feels a little bit foreign after the last 18 <laughs> months so um, good morning. I'm just so excited to be able to become part of the Board of Education and so looking forward to working with all of you for the next several months. And as you all know, my name is Leah Porter, and I just want to take a few minutes today to share a bit about myself and the passions I have for education. Oops. Hold on. Let me start it. Oh, I'm so used to Google Slides. Hold on, slideshow. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you for your patience with me. There we go. So um, I am um, from a proud family of automakers. My father, grandfather, and great-grandfather all work for General Motors and have a combined uh, 100 years of service with them. My great-grandfather helped to bring the union to his area, and um, I'm a very proud union member myself, and it's always been something that's being an educator that's been such a highlight for me. That's my grandpa in that picture from my kindergarten graduation. <laughs> um, I've lived in the Lansing area my whole life, and my first school experiences were at Henry North Elementary School in Lansing. And I, if you saw when I spoke, when I first went, I talked a lot about that school. But um, they showed me time and time again the value and importance of relationships and how they are the cornerstone to education. So I am an only child. My husband, Ryan, and I live in Lansing, and we have one son, and his name is Shane. Um, he is an amazing child. He has suffered uh, from juvenile idiopathic arthritis for most of his life and has been through a lot in his short time. Um, but um, I am always taking his resiliency and perseverance back into my own heart and into my classroom and everything that I do. He really has shown me time and time again how uh, the hardest of things can be done with positivity and hard work. So I don't ever really remember a time that I didn't want to be a teacher and that had been a goal that I had set for myself from a very young age and so I, being from Lansing, went to Michigan State University and got both my bachelor's and master's degree from there, and I am certified in elementary education, language arts 6, 8, and I am a reading specialist kindergarten through 12th grade. So for the last 15 years, I have taught kindergarten at Wilcox Elementary in Holt Public Schools, and I have to tell you that um, being a child's first teacher is such a powerful and important role, and the weight of that responsibility has never been lost on me. Over the years, my learners have taught me so much about empathy, connection, and the magic of learning. That has been the cornerstone of my focus as an educator, to build lasting relationships from the very beginnings that guide students to be confident and advocate for their needs, and building partnerships with families to see them and support them in this educational process. 
<laughs> so over the years, I've balanced my focus and attention in, class, in the classroom alongside um, different initiatives that I have a lot of passion for and I hold deep in my heart. For years, I have run the Wilcox Student Council, where I have uh, put a focus in on student leadership and community outreach and service. And over the years, we have had student-led book and bake sales to provide support for Give a Kid a Christmas for local families, specifically in our buildings. We have run many service projects across our building, including adding gardens um, across our building that the student council maintains. And uh, we do lots of projects for kids and the staff members in our building. The two summers before COVID, um, I organized a summer outreach program for our underrepresented youth where uh, we would go weekly and provide experiences, activities, and books each week right in their own backyards. We did that right there in their neighborhoods. The staff in our building and community members all came together to make really engaging experiences for the kids, and I'm excited for that to return hopefully next summer. Most recently, I have become an active member of my district's equity and access team. I have been working and running the student committee and uh, helping to run both the organizing students and mentorship committees. Um, our, our work is really focused on looking at our systems and if they provide equity and access for all students. And currently right now, I am working on a project where we are building character leadership lessons, K-6, to propel students into their secondary careers with those skills by um, embedding diverse text and um, supports for those kids and how they navigate through those things. Ooh. All right, I'm almost done. <laughs> so I thought so much about um, what I hope my platform will be this year as I embark on this year. And um, being a kindergarten teacher and an elementary teacher, and over the years, I just dive into all kinds of things. So it was really hard for me to narrow this down. But at the foundation of every aspect of teaching is community. And community, above all else, is essential to creating relationships understanding each human as a person and how students learn both individually and collectively. Community expands outside of the classroom as well, across buildings, across districts, and across our whole state. With the lens of equity and accessibility for all students, the development of community and relationships creates an environment for teachers to guide students to become leaders and instruct them in a way that allows them to grow and flourish to be their most authentic selves. I'm a little bit that of an emotional person. It always gets you. It does. Every it time gets I know, you. but it's just because I, I just feel it so deeply in my heart. And so I built this visual just to kind of represent some of the things, community, leadership, relationships, early literacy practices, to highlight the elements of areas of expertise I feel that I, I can bring forth to the Board of Education and the work I'll do this year across the state. Um, but I put equity and access in the center because I want everything that we're looking at to be centered around equity and access and thinking about these two questions that I always have in my mind. Is what I am doing equitable for all students in my classroom? And can students access the resources and opportunities of our education systems? And if we can't say yes to those things, then we need to go back and look at them again and how we do them better. So I want to wrap up today to talk a little bit about a few of the state policies and initiatives I hope to be a voice for and to help contribute to the conversation. And the first one is about the Future Proud Michigan Educator Program. Over the last year, as part of my work on the equity and access team, we have been discussing the need to embed um, educational um, workforce experiences for secondary students as we have early college opportunities in my district. And we have been fortunate enough to get one of the grants for the Future Proud Michigan Educator Program. And so we're really going to be diving in with that. I believe this work is critical um, to not only build our educational workforce, but to ensure that we are building a teaching force that mirrors the student population in this state. The second area that um, I just feel so much passion about is the third grade reading law. I don't know if everyone knows yet on this board, but I made the difficult decision three days before I won the regional award to move to third grade after spending my entire teaching career in kindergarten. And one of the reasons I chose to move was because I wanted to support struggling readers as they embark on this very critical grade and the standardized testing that is looming ahead of them. This policy is incredibly concerning to countless educators as retention of students is harmful and historically ineffective. It has long-term ramifications for students. And as we embark on this year, I will strive to use my voice to advocate for all students that could be faced with retention due to this law. 
Finally, as we continue to combat the challenges that COVID has brought in all aspects of education, being mindful of not only the educational strain, but the mental health and safety of students is paramount. Now is the opportunity to be reflective upon the lack of support schools have been able to provide over the years due to budgetary issues and how it is our greatest responsibility to support all students in not only their educational development, but their mental health and safety both in and out of the classroom. So I would be remiss not to share that as a literacy teacher, my heart belongs to books of all genres and age ranges. So much of what we teach to children can be experienced and felt through the pages of a book. I want to end today by sharing just an excerpt from this book called The Day You Begin by Jacqueline Woodson. This story is about bravery and seeing our differences as something to be celebrated and understood through the telling of our stories and getting to know each other. So I tend to be a bit of a behind the scenes person, one that does the work but prefers to stay in the shadows. And so there's an excerpt from this book that resonates so much with me and I want to share it with you now. And I'm going to try not to get emotional. <laughs> it doesn't to me every time. There will be times when the world feels like a place that you're standing all the way outside of. And all that stands beside you is your own brave self. Steady as steel and ready even though you don't yet know what you're ready for. This is the day you begin to find the places inside your laughter and your lunches, your books, your travel, your stories, where every new friend has something a little like you and something else so fabulously not quite like you at all. I look forward to learning all about you, all of your experiences, and how those experiences will allow us to work together for the betterment of students and educators in the state of Michigan. Thank you so much, and I'm so excited for the year ahead. Thank you, Leah, for sharing with us. Uh, we have Representative Julie Brixey, who's here to uh, present you with a resolution. Uh, Representative Brixey, if you would, please. Thank you. Hi, Leah. Um, congratulations, you know, to hear you speak and to see uh, the passion that you have about children, Michigan's children, is really a very, very good feeling for me. Um, my parents were both teachers, and you know, I grew up in a household of teachers. And for you, having gone through this past year in COVID, uh, I think that this award, uh, Teacher of the Year, is especially meaningful. Uh, and your decision to move to a different grade level <coughs> could best be utilized in something that is so admirable to help Michigan's children and specifically you know, kids in Wilka. Um, so um, we, have, uh, we have made a tribute for you, a special tribute. Uh, the governor has signed it in addition to all uh, of the And um, one of the things that this does is that um, Leah has a commitment to serving underrepresented students and is an active member of both equity and equity. Her commitment to giving all children both the freedom and security of a trusted learning space within her classroom has truly made a difference in her students' lives. It is an honor to have Leah as a teacher in our community. And we know that uh, Wilcox Elementary and Health Public School District is a better place because of you. So thank you so much thank for you very all much. of the work thank that you do for thank all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Representative Brixey. Appreciate that. Um, now, Dr. Rice, we would like to get into the fun part. Not that this wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I'm going to go through and introduce all the regional teachers of the year. They're going to come in this door. Dr. Rice is going to present them. They'll get their picture, and they'll go out the other door just to keep everybody safe. So Region 1 is Heather French. She's an English no, the English language arts and visual arts teacher at Lake Linden Hubble Middle High School at Lake Linden Schools. And Travis Peterson, her spouse, is here to support her today. Mm 
Thank you. We'll get your pictures with that. Oh, right okay. Casey Hook from Region 2 is an English language arts and drama teacher at Roscommon Middle School and Roscommon Area Public Schools. Principal Catherine Fueling and Linda Miller, her mother, are here to support Casey. Catherine, if you want to take the other plaque too. Thank you. Region 3, Teresa Ziegler, a social studies teacher at Makatawa Bay Middle School in West Ottawa Public Schools. Principal Kristen Graham is here to support Teresa. Region 4, Sheldora Haynes is a third grade teacher at Martin G. Atkins Elementary School in Bridgeport Spalding Community Schools. Principal Debbie Johnson and Brandis Haynes, her daughter, are here to support Sheldora. Region 5, Janet Swarthout as a speech and drama teacher at Carroll High School and Carroll Community Schools. Principal Stephen Clark and colleague Kathleen Yearman are here to support Janet. Region 7 is James Johnson. He's a social studies teacher at Loy Noor High School in Kalamazoo Public Schools. Principal Chris Aguanaga is here to support James. Nailed that. Boom. Region 8 is Bethany Vonk. She's an English language arts teacher at Washtenaw International Middle Academy in the Washtenaw Educational Options Consortium. Randy, Beth's spouse, is here to support her today. Region 9 is Brian Paul. He's a fourth grade teacher at Highview Elementary School in Crestwood School District. Principal Linda Talib and colleague Carolyn Hassan are here to support Brian. Region 10 is Joe Ver Versanello. He's a music teacher at Voyager Academy in Detroit. Joe's son, Sela, is here to support him. <laughs> and daughter. <laughs>
And then we also have a, um, a plaque and a resolution to give to Owen, which is the last time. If we want to take a minute to do that, we weren't able to do that last year. Excuse me, Ellen. I was given special instructions oh. <laughs> by my boss Separated. about this. Okay. So these are in two parts. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank Be you. Be vigilant. I will. Thank you. <laughs> President Albrecht, we decided not to give the book out on how to teach this year. <laughs> Got rid of those. Um, Superintendent Rice, I'd like to take a minute to thank Pam Harlan, who is out in the gallery. Um, she is the director of the Education Foundation, and she finances, along with the program, um, for the Michigan Teacher of the Year and the Regional Teachers of the Year. And this year, they upped the... Uh, Auntie to fifty thousand dollars to provide support to our program. So I just want to take a minute to thank her for her. <laughs> Region six teacher of the year and Michigan teacher of the year is Leah Porter. She's a kindergarten teacher slash third grader teacher at <laughs> Wilcox <laughs> Elementary and Holt Public Schools. Principal Tracy Hoyes and Superintendent Dr. Uh, David Hornack are here to support Leah. Thank you, Dr. Rice and board. I appreciate the honor to sit here and present the Regional Teachers of the Year to you. And uh, thank Dr. Um, Director Breen for her support and Dr. Chapman for your first time at the board. Welcome. And that's all I have today. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, your work. We appreciate the work of Ms. Breen, Dr. Chapman, Ms. Porter. We are looking forward to working with you and the Regional Teachers of the Year to make this a greater and greater profession for our 1.44 million public school children in the state of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your leadership. Thank you. We'll take a minute and uh, let people transition. You warned me, now I have to be vigilant. What's that? You warned me, and now the vigilance comes in. <laughs> when we're on a presentation of return to school um, in Michigan, since our last state board meeting, the number of COVID 19 cases has risen from eight. 891,057 to 913,220, an increase of approximately 2.5% in the last two months, with the number of deaths increasing from 19,432 to 19,958, a rise of 2.7%. After flattened case numbers in June and July, our numbers and those across the country have begun to rise of late, function of the Delta variant and pockets of unvaccinated individuals in communities across the state and country. The good news is that our vaccination rates have climbed and that those protected by vaccinations are far less likely to get infected, let alone experience substantial sickness, hospitalization, and death. The bad news is that the research indicates that fully vaccinated individuals not only can experience breakthrough cases, albeit in very low percentages, but can transmit the virus. That said, unvaccinated individuals are far more likely to be vulnerable than our vaccinated individuals.
for sickness, hospitalization, and death. According to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, worldwide, there have been 203.2 million cases of coronavirus and more than 4.3 million deaths as of last night. Nationally, there have been 35.9 million cases of coronavirus and more than 617,000 deaths as of last night, with 17.7 percent of the world's cases and 14.4 percent of the world's deaths associated with COVID-19. The U.S. leads the world in both categories. Worldwide, more than 4.4 billion vaccine doses have been administered, more than double the number that had been administered by our June board meeting. In Michigan, more than 9.3 million vaccine doses have been administered, an increase of more than 10 percent since our last board meeting. According to the CDC, almost 64 percent of Michigan's population 16 years old or over have received at least an initial dose of vaccine, an increase of five percentage points since the last state board meeting. I have just a few quick updates for you today. First is on the new school year and waivers. We're used to thinking board of the day after Labor Day is the first day of school in the state of Michigan. That said, more districts over the last several years have recognized the challenges associated with summer slide and have begun to ask for waivers to start before Labor Day. Indeed, in the last three years, the number of intermediate school districts asking for waivers for their constituent local school districts to begin school prior to Labor Day has increased from 29 to 49 of the 56 ISDs in the state. While the request for a waiver from the ISD does not mean that all local school districts within the ISD plan to use the waiver and begin early, it is nonetheless indicative of an important trend in district planning and implementation. Kudos to the Flint Community Schools, which began its school year last week on August 4th. Best wishes to Flint and our 830 LEAs across the state of Michigan. A pivot to a new, better normal. It's been a long time since we had a state board meeting, since we don't meet in July. Since the last state board meeting, the legislature passed and the governor signed a state school aid act into law. I appreciated the governor's leadership in recommending a path to all children eligible for the four-year-old Great Start Readiness Program being able to receive GSRP services, and I appreciate the legislature's partnership in this effort. We have a long way to go across the state in the next three years to make GSRP universal, work on the hiring and training of staff, the identification and creation of space, and hardest of all, the raising of consciousness that school begins not at five or six, but at four. Nonetheless, this bipartisan agreement of the importance of early childhood education, whose expansion is the first goal board of the state's top 10 strategic education plan, is an important accomplishment. The department was integral in this effort and will remain so as we expand from 37,000 children annually to 59,000 children annually who receive GSRP services. Importantly, this coming year's budget increases the per pupil revenue for full-time GSRP students from $7,250 to $8,700 per full-time student. It increases the minimum foundation allowance to $8,700 for K-12 students. While we still have a long way to go on school funding, both adequacy and equity, this budget was a bipartisan accomplishment on improving the adequacy of school funding, the most significant budget increase in post-Proposal A memory. The budget increases will help in all of our top 10 state strategic education plan goal areas, and particularly goals 1, 2, 3, and 7, the expansion of early childhood education, the improvement of early literacy, the improvement of health, safety, and wellness, and the addressing of the teacher shortage. On health guidance, in the last couple of weeks, 
both the Federal Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services have put out guidance on mitigation strategies for schools. As you know, board, vaccinations are strongly recommended for all who are eligible. Masks and social distancing are as well. Masks on buses are mandated. The department has joined MDHHS in urging local and intermediate school districts to implement these and other mitigation strategies in a layered approach to prevention. Unlike last school year, which we began without a vaccine and by extension without individuals having been vaccinated, these are strong recommendations of CDC and of MDHHS. With the exception of masks on buses, there are no mandates. That said, if we want to have the best public health and public education year possible, we will work hard as schools, as school districts, and as a state to minimize disruptions to education, our children, and to maximize instructional time. The best way to do this is to layer mitigation strategies. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Uh, otherwise, we can move forward uh, with our agenda. Uh, hearing and seeing no questions. Um, we are very, very pleased to welcome our next guests um, to, um, to the State Boardroom. Our guest presenters uh, are from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. They are here to share information on safe educational environments for children. We welcome our presenters, Ms. Regina Strong, Environmental Justice Public Advocate, and Mr. Robert Jackson, Assistant Division Director slash Energy Ombudsman in the Materials Management Division of EGLE. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Presenters, welcome. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. You want to you're going to be right. You're going to be right where Jen Cook is. That's right. She's she's firing it up for you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As Superintendent Rice said, I'm Regina Strong. I'm the Environmental Justice Public Advocate, and I'm joined by Robert Jackson, who leads our Energy Office. When I was speaking to you all virtually back in February, we talked about um, the HVAC assist assessment program that we were launching at that time. And we wanted to kind of give you an update, talk to you about where we are now, some of the opportunities and some of the challenges, quite frankly, of getting that done in the environment we're in right now. So I'm going to hand things over to Robert and let him talk through where we are on the program. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to, uh, to present on the uh, our findings on the on the Education 12 Public HVAC Assistance Program. We started this this work nearly a year ago, and it was based upon what we were seeing and conversations that we were having with school board uh, superintendents and with you know, the maintenance staff within the schools, and frankly, what we were seeing within state government itself. Uh, at the time that we launched the program, the Department <coughs> of Management and Budgets was also launching a, a similar program on all state buildings, looking at the ventilation systems, looking at the readiness for state workers to return to work. And so a lot of what you're going to hear today is also based upon what the state actions, the actions that the state has been taking, as well as actions that are being taken within uh, municipal government and within the federal government in, in ensuring that the buildings are ready for the occupancy. And again, as I said, we started this program about a year ago. And, and in the start of the program, we did work with, uh, with, with Kyle and his staff uh, in VA. And, um, and they're very helpful in terms of helping us figure out what needs to be done, making the contact for us. And so together we reached out to every school district within the state of Michigan, asking them to complete a survey. So the purpose of the survey was to figure out where everybody was in terms of, of readiness, as well as what was the condition of the equipment and what was types of, 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 of ventilation systems that were installed within other 
uh, in, in Michigan uh, public schools, K through 12 schools. And in that, that, in that survey that we sent out, we asked a series of questions. And again, we sent it out to every school district. Um, the number of responses was, was fairly low. I think we, we received responses from just over 100 school districts. But within that information, we were able to develop a profile, a profile of where rural schools were in terms of their, of what systems they would install, uh, what suburban schools and what, and what urban schools were. And I, and I think that the, the numbers that we were getting and the information we were getting was fairly accurate. Coupled with that, uh, we began to meet with uh, licensed uh, heat and ventilation contractors and with others within um, associations, ASHRAE, DOE, uh, and within state government and in consultation with, uh, with DTMB and their maintenance staff on, on what information we needed to collect you know, from these schools in addition to the survey questions in order to, to make certain projections. And, and, I'll, and I'll talk about those in detail. And so in what we, what we ended up doing was contracting with over 30 licensed heating and ventilation contracts. And we commissioned them to go out and do heating and ventilation assessments at any public school that wanted to get an assessment. We set aside money from, that we had reserved from other programs and money that we had reserved from the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the stimulus money from the Reauthorization Act uh, from several years ago. And we put that money forth to contract out with contractors to go out and do assessments. Of those schools that were that were notified of the assessment, we signed it back. I think there were roughly around 60-something schools that did actually receive assessments. What you're going to see is the results of those assessments. Now, we have at least 20 assessments that are still in the queue, and they're a combination of, again, uh, rural, public, and in, in, in urban. And there are a few uh, environmental justice schools in that, in that mix. So... Uh, yes. okay. So here's kind of like the, the preliminary findings that we that we were seeing. Of those schools that we did go out and we 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 we, we did surveys to, we you know we did on site for, we found out that 47 percent of those school buildings have not upgraded their heating and ventilation system in the past 15 years. We also began to realize that 35 percent of those schools have not updated their systems in the past 20 years. And then 21% had not upgraded the systems in the past 25 years. When we look at that in terms of those environmental justice schools that we audited, there were 67% that not had an HVAC system updated in, in, in 25 or more years. And the numbers are, are, are fairly... No, this <coughs> And so here are the results of, you know, kind of the on-site surveys of what we've seen. Again, what we were trying to do when we did the on-site services on-site assistance, it was for two purposes. One was to get a sense of what repairs were needed in these various schools, because you know, they're all different geographically and in terms of size, um, uh, architect, uh, and makeup and operations, they're all different. And so we wanted to do two things. One is to get a sense of what was needed, and the other was how much it was going to cost to actually do the repair work. And so what you see up there is really two, two categories. One, if you did everything, you know, if you replaced the new equipment um, with the, uh, the minimum uh, efficiency uh, reporting value, the MERV 13, did dynamic filters, put in humidification, did a bipolar ionization, upgrading the building uh, management system, sensors. In an elementary school, the range is anywhere between 200 to 1.3 million per building. If you did it in the high school, the range was anywhere between 1.1 to 2 million per building. If you stepped down lower and not did the humidification or the, the building uh, management system in, um, and you, you were to, to, to go in and upgrade the, the unit ventilators and then upgrade it to MERS 13 filters in, in or the central areas and put in the dynamic filter, air filters with bipolar ionization and you just recommission the building, the numbers are a little bit low, more reasonable. In an elementary, is 110,000 or 460,000 per building, and the high schools are 210 to 560,000 per building. Now, we just didn't rely upon the survey data. We actually 
In addition to this, because we thought the numbers were fairly large, we went out. We did. Um, we had conversations with a number of of uh, performance contractors, and those are uh, in, uh, firms that actually go out and do uh, energy assessments and energy efficiency work at schools um, and within um, uh, government buildings, uh, just to get a sense of whether or not our numbers were in line with what they were seeing in the actual contracts that they were writing. The, the next one. And so the first conversation we had was with, uh, with TRAIN. They gave us some cost estimates on what they're currently doing on Michigan K-12 schools. And what we were looking at is the range for elementary schools, 50,000 to 110 per building, uh, middle school, 120 to 355, and then high schools, 140 to 580. And those are really in range with what we see if we were to look at some of the, the, the that, that second category, if we, we were doing those efficiency work that would be, that would bring the schools up on par and bring them to code. And this is kind of important because you can go in and you can do the work for less, but it doesn't mean that building is at code. And what we were projecting was that in, in our numbers is what needs to be done to bring the building to code. Now, if you did less work building upgrades, uh, and you did it on a square foot basis, new upgrades and building um, management systems, train estimates were were fairly reasonable, 700, you know, 75,000 to 220 for the middle school, the same numbers that we were getting, uh, 270 to 850, high schools uh, 450 to a million per school. But if you went into, you know, some schools that they were working on. Uh, that were in more um, need of repair than some of the others, you can see that for elementary school, the actual work requirement was roughly about 1.4 million. For middle school, in disrepair, it's about 3 million. And for high school, again, in disrepair, it's about 6.2 million. The note that they wanted to make sure that we were conveying was that nearly 10% of all schools have only radiant or convection heat, no modern ventilation at all. So in some of the older school districts that you see, the numbers are going to be higher. Next slide, please. So we didn't stop there. We went to Performance Services, um, who's also a performance contractor. Uh, they work in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and um, in other states across the, the U.S. And here's what they're seeing in Michigan schools in terms of what is needed. Elementary schools, 21 classrooms, nearly a million. Uh, high school, 35 classrooms, nearly 1.6. Um, look at the classrooms with existing um, the ventilation, air, air actuators, and, and, and valving, um, and then upgrading with the um, excuse me, the, the air, hand, air handling units um, with the, the going to MER, MER 13, uh, bipolar ionization, digital controls. The numbers at the high end are 630, 1.0, 1, 1, nearly 1 million. And then the next slide. And then if the same for others that we had reached out to who are actually doing work on schools, there's one with Trevor City, um, it's roughly half a million. Um, for Denton Harbor Schools, you know, the, the cost could be range anywhere, could, could reach close to three, 3 million. Uh, Eagle Nest Academy, 300,000. Um, and then we have uh, one assessment where we're looking at rooftop units, rooftop, uh, rooftop units and replacements, humidification. There are ranges within what the ranges that we have projected in terms of what it was actually going to cost to do the work. Now, uh, yeah. So I guess what I wanted to, to, to convey was that. The cost is, 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 is going to, well, I should mention this. When we did these cost projections, the cost projections were based upon the cost and availability of resources in March, in April of this year. That is not the case anymore. Now, with the scarcity of resources, the scarcity of supply and of labor, these costs could be higher. And, and that's the one thing I wanted to communicate with. In talking with some of the contractors who were working with us, who were, who were sort of contracted to originally do, as I said, that we had 20 assessments in EJ communities that need to be done, they were unable to do that because they were 
they saw opportunity to do work in other districts, I mean, other work for more money in, in other districts. And so it was, we were unable to do those, but we have found some contractors that will pick up that slack. And the, and the point that I'm trying to convey is the longer you delay, the more it's going to cost you, not because of the, 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 the despair, the, the equipment will go into despair, it's just that there's a supply and demand problem. And then on top of this problem that we're having right now, we, we're, we're seeing with the infrastructure bill, the same work that we're looking to do in the K through 12 schools are also going to be funded through the infrastructure bill that, that, that the Senate is passing today. Everything that we're looking at, in term, but that will happen in the commercial sector. And so that's where, and a lot of these, a lot of this equipment is being purchased and stockpiled. I'm sorry, a lot of the equipment is? Being purchased and stockpiled to be used in, in, to be used in other applications at a future date at a higher cost. The, but is it too late to take any action? No, I think that, you know, now is about, now is about the, the, when we did, when we did the projected doing this, this, designing the program last year, the thinking was, is that let's get some, some preliminary information and then let's get some work done over the, over the Christmas holidays. And we thought that there could be some things that could be done between December and January, you know, just temporary things to set up work for the summer. And I think the same approach should apply now, is that the approach should be, let's, you know, if we can encourage the district to start taking some actions, they can take some actions during the Christmas holiday when the, when the schools are shut down, and they can take more actions uh, during the summer when the schools are shut down for some reason. At the same time, if you take action now, with any agreement that you set up, you can secure the services of a contractor, plus the contractor can can reasonably secure the services of subcontractors to do the work, which could control or, or keep your costs at a minimum so that they're not escalating. Again, I think that that would be a prudent and reasonable action to take, given the fact that if you look at the infrastructure bill that's passed through Congress, legislation will be in effect sometime in January, January, February, just like with the, the Recovery Act of nine years ago. And once that legislation is in effect, and money start coming to, you know, states for, 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 for similar, inter, similar projects that we're doing in K-12 schools, but in the commercial sector and in the, and in the, the municipal buildings, then the contractors will start being, you, you won't see a contractor available to do this kind of work. So there is kind of an urgency if you, if these schools work with the improvements, the planning should take place quickly. There are some resources, and that's on the, the last page. And the EPA has some information that they would that we can. Uh, oh, it's not, not on that. Page. Oh, no, no. <laughs> sorry about that. We can, we'll, we'll provide you with those resources. That's fine. In, yeah. a, in a separate. That that's terrific. That that was a lot for uh, lay people to oh, right. wrap their wrap their heads around. You you clearly are quite expert in this. Um, we appreciate the presentation. Board members, questions or comments um, of Ms. Strong or Mr. Jackson, Ms. Snyder. Uh, I definitely um, applaud the efforts to overhaul HVAC systems. It's not just healthy, right, for the air that we breathe, but the way that our buildings maintain over time. Um, I'm just curious, $3 million, is that a number for one school, or is that a number for one school district? And is that a bid that you're getting from, like an average bid that you're getting from Okay. Uh, the three million that was referenced, that was um, a, uh, a a current agreement from um, the the Egan Company, and it was at Bitten Harbor, based on three schools: on Bitten Harbor Fair Plain Middle School, uh, Kenowa Middle, I mean Kenowa Hill Middle, and the high schools. So that was for three. So that was to overhaul the HVAC oh, system, yes. redesign new system for Correct. three schools. Okay. Correct. Just wanted to um, confirm and kind of place that number. Thank you. Other questions or comments, board members? Dr. Pugh. Thank you for your presentation and for coming. And I guess um, my thoughts are um, this kind of doesn't tell me a lot unless I know what the buildings 
are. And I guess I'll start with when you said environmental justice school, if you could define that, unless I missed it. So what we did when this program was first conceived, um, it was because of air quality conversations, um, which primarily focused on communities in Southwest Detroit. That was the initial um, conversation. So when the opportunity went out for all schools to participate once we developed the program, we prioritized those schools. And schools like schools in Denner Harbor, schools in Southwest Detroit, you know, one of the challenges, and I think Robert mentioned this, is the availability versus folks being able to take action on it. And so we did a lot of outreach, but not as many schools as we would like took us up on it. Um, we're still willing to look at, you know, and, and Robert and I have had this conversation because he's sure. like the go-to guy when I'm trying to find money to, to, to push forward on these things. And is there money available to continue to do the assessment so schools know what they are? Because not at, it's a small fraction who've taken advantage of the program so mm -hmm. far. And the environmental justice schools are a priority. And so that conversation with them continues to try to get that done. Right. Um, and then contractor availability has slowed the process. Ms. Strong, I'm sorry, just for a point of clarification, if you could define for our broader audience mm -hmm. again, yeah. The, the, the EJ schools, the environmental justice schools, because I think that, that really sets up the rest of it. I think that's where Dr. Pugh was going. Uh, okay. So how we are defining environmental justice schools are in communities that are typically lower income and oftentimes communities of color. And so we have um, communities that are, that are self-defined in terms of considering themselves environmental justice communities, but those are the two factors we look at. In addition to that, sometimes it's either or. Oftentimes there are communities that may not be um, communities of color, but are also lower income that we try to prioritize. And so we try to make sure that schools that are in what I think we use a lot in terms of government funding, in terms of disadvantaged communities, are prioritized along with other schools that are, you know, it's available to all the schools, but we prioritize environmental justice and initially set aside money to focus on those schools. Um, <clears throat> however, we need to expand, and that's what Robert and I have been talking about, because we've only had a small fraction we've been able to touch. I have a lot of thoughts. I'm going to try to get through them all. So, and I, I'm, I'm familiar with how the program got started and mm -hmm. kind of like kept in touch with how the program is going. My concern are that this information is concerning on a good day. We're in the midst of a worldwide global pandemic where other mitigation um, factors or, or tools that we have, uh, we're being asked to, to remove those. Um, and we know that we have school buildings that have been neglected for years. And so this data is troubling to me, but the presentation is troubling to me because if we mention environmental justice schools, but as if you look, go back a few slides, because it may be to the very first slides. Let me just say this. We're opening schools right now in the midst of this worldwide pandemic. That is airborne. Um, that is, we've known that for some time now. Um, but schools have not necessarily been able to focus on that to prepare their children to come back to be healthy and safe in those buildings. Oh, I thought you said something. No, no. So, so one of the um, concerns that I have, too, is that I get why you would want to go to environmental justice communities and make sure that this, this program is received. In your numbers, when you talked about the demographics of the school buildings, and how, what percentage of those buildings were EJ schools? The one, oh, I think I know which one you're talking about. You're talking about yes. this one right here. Yes. Okay. So those were that responded to the survey. Again, this, this the survey, this does not cover all the schools. This was just based upon, we knew that there were 100 something district, 105 or, or maybe less districts actually responded to our initial survey. 
That's 105 30. of the 830 in the state. Yeah. Is yeah, that correct? I mean, uh, yeah. yeah so, 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 so we're talking about roughly an eighth of the of the districts chose to respond, chose exactly, to participate. Exactly. Exactly. And then I will add that we set aside a set amount of money to make sure that there are probably and Robert, um, I think there were somewhere between eight and twelve environmental justice schools that were prioritized. They didn't have to um, go through all of the process because initially there's an application process, the whole thing. We reached out to them. But that's a small fraction and we know. And so we continued to prioritize even with our bigger pot of money. Right. But there was enough money to set aside for those. Some of those are still in process. Okay, and I'm just trying to understand. So when you say that there were eight schools, they're in, included in this 105 or you're saying they're separate from the 105? Are they included in that number? Yeah, they're all they included. That's it, what I it was, yeah, they're, okay. they're, they're so, all included. So let me ask one more question. Are you saying sure. that those were the only eight of the 105 that were in EJ? No. Okay. No, there were more. There oh, were more. there were more. Yeah, okay. More but EJ. there were those that, and so that was the genesis of the program, was those eight schools. And then it grew from there. Right. Yeah, right. So how many of the 105 are EJ schools? Um, yeah, I have that number. I can, I can provide yep, that yep. number. Too. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think that and that's we still prioritize it and right. moving forward. Yeah. So the program was open up to, to all <coughs> school districts, and mm -hmm. just that we we you know un, under you know what working with Regina, we decided that Wonderful. we would prioritize the EJ schools because mm -hmm. we knew we had limited resources to actually do the on-site assessments to do the contractual work, mm -hmm. and so priority was going to be given to the EJ schools. I'm so whether they were earmarked or applied. Right. So because some applied and some we said we want to focus initially on these right. And and I, I want to make sure I'm I'm expressing where my concern is. My concern I'm not surprised at, mm -hmm. at responses because mm -hmm. we were in Flint. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in the state when money was given and we couldn't get that money out because if districts don't know where the next tranche of dollars are going to come to fix the problem. Right. Here's the other thing. If you have snake oil salesmen coming to tell you that we have foggers, we have filters mm -hmm. that will remove a uh, pathogen, they're going to take that. We have plexiglass that we can put between uh, class classrooms. And I'm concerned because we're talking about the schools that uh, barely can get three feet between um, desks. And we're talking about the schools that already didn't have windows to open, ventilation. Right. Uh, you know, I talk about the heat in the winter or air in the summer. So I want to know where those schools are because we get a lot of data. We get a lot of data from the CDC that talks about how schools are safe. But if we don't know what those schools are that are the worst hit, those schools where the parents weren't sending their kids to school, and now if Flint opens their doors, other school districts are opening their doors. I want to know what's going on in those buildings, the children that have been hit the hardest, mm -hmm. the schools that have had the least amount of attention um, on ventilation or anything else, have the least amount of uh, maintenance workers to even be concerned with this, don't have the, um, the teachers prior to COVID and definitely now uh, in many of these schools to be able to put some distance between these kids. And I have, uh, we have people who don't want folks to wear masks in classrooms. So we've got to bring this all home. And this, this presentation needs to lead with that type of equity. And especially if we're talking about environmental justice. And I know that's something that you're really concerned with, but this is an urgency. And, and I want to know what's going on in those buildings that are opening up their doors who have not taken up this assessment. Who is coming to them? Um, let's talk about the foggers um, that people are bragging about that could also be putting children's health at stake versus doing what needed to be done. Um, so the, the, these are all concerns of mine and it's an urgency um, that I just don't see in the presentation. So I'll, I'll kind of start and, and Robert, I'll let, I know okay. you're going to come from more of a technical angle, so I'll, I'll just start by saying I hear you, Dr. T, and I agree, um, which is why these assessments have been with only certified contractors, yeah. because there are a lot of people yeah. saying, oh, I can clear, you know, this. Mm -hmm. 
And that was a concern of ours early on. And so Robert, who does this all the time in terms of working um, in the energy space, looked to get certified folks, looked to get people who were. Right. Unfortunately, it's been difficult for us with, uh, with from a resource standpoint right. to touch every single school. So right. we've tried to outreach, and that outreach continues. Because mm -hmm. you're right, the priority should be the schools that are least in a position to respond to, to, to whatever the challenges are when it comes to COVID, whether it is the building itself or, you know, safety for the children. And so that's been our priority. And Robert, I know you and I have talked about right. why it's so important to have the, the certified folks and who are going to give them a real assessment. And that's why it's been hard to find folks. Right. I just wanted to, to, to add, Dr. Few, is that you know that we, you know, this is our data, and these are from the assessments that we, surveys that we had sent out and we collected, we had analyzed, and then from the on-site assessments where we had the license contractors go out and actually do assessments. And so I know one of your questions is really is the outreach, and who's going out there and talking to these schools about what they can and cannot do, and what makes sense for them. We have, you know, in parallel to this, began to work with the performance contractors, not the ones that, you know, not only the ones that we have listed there, trained um, in, in, in Johnson Controls, uh, Brewer and Gar Garnet, and in performance services. We've talked with others for them just to go talk to the school districts and talk to the schools mm -hmm. and the superintendents to talk to them about, you know, you know, here are the services that we offer and here is kind of the contractual relationship that we can do this work under that would reduce your cost and improve improve the ventilation system. I, I want to step back from improve the air quality because we're not taking indoor air quality sampling data. Uh, hmm. So I, I can't attest to right. what is the environmental condition of that, that building. We just simply are looking at the mechanicals within the building and assessing what needs to be done to bring them to code. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Um, Dr. Albrich, and, and then Mr. Strayhorn, thank you. Yeah, so this, uh, it's obviously very enlightening because there's tremendous costs involved here. And just trying to understand the funding. So, so you guys received funding. Was it federal or state to do the initial study? Mm, so we had some reserve money we're funded through our office is funded through the state energy program which is a um it's a federally funded uh program from the department of energy and so every year we receive an appropriation to do the work mm -hmm. we set aside money from that state energy program grant that we receive from the, from the department of energy to do this work and so and the work only included three things one doing the the surveys paying for the contractors to go to do the on-site assessments and we do have some money reserved for technology demonstration projects. And we hope to still do those. So, so it didn't cost the schools any money for the study to come in, but now they've got this huge price tag. Um, are you, if I heard you correctly, are you thinking the infrastructure bill at the federal level is going to help support these costs? Or what is no, the I would just, what are the when options I reference the, the infrastructure bill, I was referencing as a competing for oh, the resources okay. that would be needed to make the retrofits within the K-12 school. So, so now that a school has this price tag, like Benton Harbor, up to $3 million for three schools, what do they do with that? Well, oh, go ahead. for that particular one, I think that work is ongoing. That was under a contract or a bond. At least that was my understanding based on talking with the contractor. So it's a local bond. So basically the schools have to figure out a, a funding mechanism to be able to pay for the work at this point. Yeah. Unfortunately, the state, this project did not include the, the funding aspect of it. You know, it. We were tasked with simply developing a profile of what are the mechanics within the mechanicals within those schools mm -hmm. and what repair work needs to be done to bring them to vote. So this may not be a question for you. It might be a question for the department, but can the federal CARES Act and... and can that be used to fund this? Got it. Okay. Thank you. So, so uh, I just want I want to answer the unasked question. Um, CARES Act ESSER one, CRESA ESSER two, ARPA ARPA ESSER three, and, and and the answer is yes. They they can be used 
um, to support these sorts of initiatives. Those, those uh, pandemic relief funds are narrower than we would like them to be, but they nonetheless include the sort of mechanical uh, upgrades that Ms. Strong and Mr. Jackson are, are referencing here. So yeah. yes. So the only, and the problem might not be necessarily funding, the problem might be that there's now a lack of actual equipment and, and people to do the work and all of that. Um, there, is a, there is a race to get uh, this work accomplished uh, on or before September 30th, 2024 for the third of the three pandemic relief acts. Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Mr. Strayhorn, Ms. Lipton um, remotely, and then Ms. Snyder. Okay, so that, that was a great presentation. From a technical aspect, I know that it, it can be, you know, a little, little confusing with the numbers and you're talking about HVAC systems and you're getting into technical application. I want to ask a question on that. When you said that you can begin to do some of the upgrades like during the Christmas holiday, right. you know, this is after the children actually go into the schools, right? Uh, the students, and you're saying that they can start to do some of those. I saw that there was a, a stat that you had that said 10% of the schools had less than, what was it, they used the boiler systems, I believe? Yeah, that was an um, observation from, from, from train. When they, if they go out and they do their, their assessments on, on, on K-12 schools in Michigan, they're op I guess more of an observation. They observed that nearly 10% of the, of, of the school buildings that they have gone into only have radiant or radiant or convection heat. Okay, there it is, right there. Okay, radiant or convection heat. Right. Now, those typically are the old asbestos wrapped pipes, correct? Basically, yes. Yeah. So, when you're talking about doing an overhaul like that, these costs of six million, let's say on the high side, what about the the environmental remediation when you're talking about taking those things out of a building? Those those costs are are those factored into that? Um, so again, this was from train and this, I, I can only, I, I can assume, I didn't ask that specific question and I can, but I believe that when they do spec out the work, that it does include remediation and replacement. Right. Okay. Because typically, you know, those things take a lot of time to remediate. Right. There, that becomes another airborne issue right. within the building. So it takes time. So you'd have to have a due care plan to not have people, you know, and you would Breathing. typically do that in the summer. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Unless it was an extraordinarily small corner of the building, you're not going to replace a mechanical system, and particularly not with asbestos uh, remediation in the in uh, you know over a, a winter break. Um, it's gonna it's gonna take you know it's gonna take several weeks to to right. accomplish a couple months to accomplish in a large building. And um, that's a different conversation. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, each of these was an individual specked out project, giving the local school district a sense of what they needed, kind of moving them along the path toward replacement or upgrade of their systems. Is that right? Correct. Um, all of the participating schools and districts receive a report of the findings from the licensed contractor that did the on-site assessment. Okay. Mr. Sheehan, I want to make sure your questions got answered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what I'm saying, so with that, then currently those buildings that you know, we have a, like what Dr. Pugh was talking about, a global pandemic that is airborne, they don't have proper ventilation as it is currently, these buildings. Out of 105 that you've surveyed that actually got specced out you know, we have, we have an issue with ventilation in these buildings. But we're going to put the children, the students, and the, and the teachers and support staff in those buildings, even though the ventilation isn't up to code, up to where it should be, is the question. That's, I can't answer that question because I'm not an environmental <laughs> scientist. I'm a chemical engineer with, with specialization. In, in some of the mechanics, so I can't answer the, the can, like, as, I, as I, I guess I mentioned before, is that we didn't do air quality, indoor air quality. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're simply looking at, we're assessing the, the current state of the mechanical systems within the schools. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing that we did during the Recovery Act, 
where we looked at the mechanical system yeah. within each one of these state buildings. Yes. It, we, we took the same approach. And then for that, we did a report. And based on the report and the findings from that report, the Department of Management and Budget took actions to do the remediation with those buildings. Okay. All right. You began to flesh out the extent of the issue or the problem. Yes. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. We've got uh, Ms. Lipton, Ms. Snyder, Dr. Pugh, in that order. Ms. Lipton. Ms. Lipton, can you hear us now? Like a bad Verizon commercial. <laughs> she said about five minutes ago she got dropped from the call and she's trying to rejoin. Very good. Ms. Snyder, Dr. Pugh, and then back to Ms. Lipton. Ms. Snyder. So, um, several things, and I'll just kind of engage with Jason a little bit here, too, as well. Um, where to start? I appreciate his question of does the remediation, is it included in that number? It's a pretty high number considering, right? And so you would like to assume that the remediation is involved in that. Um, I think that's why it's good to be working with certified contractors. Those high quality contractors should also include any time you do a remodel or re whatever. Um, anything that it takes to take something out and remediate it before you put something new in, you don't want to then get hit with that on the, on the backside, right? So. Hopefully that is the case. Um, the number should be the number, right? right. Um, but I will, I mean, when we talk about air quality, I mean, just the fact that we're wearing masks, it, it, it does, you know, the science there says that oxygenation is generally lower, not that our bodies can't adapt to it or um, adjust. So I wouldn't necessarily, not that we don't want to consider HVAC something we continue to move towards and Air quality is something we value. We'll continue to work towards it. Um, but learning is also um, important when we consider all things, right, in the discussion. Um, supply and demand we talked about. Uh, I sure hope we just keep moving forward in terms of being able to manufacture the parts that are needed to do this so that we can do it in a timely manner. I, I think that's um, the policy that we've seen in the last 18 months is, is is pretty significantly and directly related to the ability to manufacture those parts and, and get the work done. Um, and then when I, I think about certified HVAC providers, we need more. One of the discussions we've had at the board table a lot is related to CTE programs. A lot of times we lose students, right, if they're moving in that direction, but they don't have any programming within their schools to encourage them to pick up the pieces and play with them and decide, do I have an interest in this? Um, We've shared concerns over, you know, tracking students by encouraging CTE, but I, I think we should pull back from that concept. I should think we should lean into um, students in ninth, 10th, and 11th grade earlier, the better, being able to show interest in these areas so that we can have those certified HVAC providers, you know, sooner and, and more so as soon as possible. I think that's some, a discussion that our board has tried to take part in can continue to do so and should in the future. Um, so just, just a few things to throw out there. So I could say this in regards to, you know, license HVAC contractors and, and putting together curriculum and trying to encourage uh, kids in, you know, 9th and 11th grade to begin to start thinking about this is another opportunity for community colleges. I think in the board recall, I think it may be three, four years ago, um, DTE, Consumers Energy, and I think a couple of other uh, utility companies in both the electric and gas probably came to you and said, look, we have a retiring workforce in, in line workers and gas line workers that we need to put, you know, we need to work with you to put together these programs, not only within, you know, K through 12, but with community colleges to replace those retiring workers. And, and there was a part of that project where programs were set up in partnership with, you know, the Department of Education and with community colleges around the state to put these internships and to put this curriculum in place and certification in place to to speak. so that these kids had a fast track into the utilities. Mm -hmm. And it worked as their workforce is being is retiring. These kids are going into those positions. It's the same thing here. I think that there's that we have this opportunity to stress that you know these are good paying jobs. You know some of them are six figures. Um, this is something that should be done not only within you know with K through 12, but also within um, 
within the, uh, the, uh, the, the community colleges around the state in order to prepare these students to actually take, take part in this, this great opportunity that we've seen in front of us that are not necessarily kind of a four-year college degree, but a skilled technician, a trade, something that, that could be with them and service them throughout their life. I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you for the work that you guys are Th doing. Thank you very much. Dr. Pugh, Ms. Lipton, and then my benediction. Um, uh, thank you all uh, for, for the presentation. And I, I want you to know that I have been speaking very highly of this program. And as many um, uh, superintendents that I come across, as a matter of fact, we were on the call with the superintendent recently, kind of like trying to get a feel for what it was that he was doing and making sure that he knew that this more thorough um, assessment by qualified folks, the most qualified folks were um, available to them because a lot of schools were rushed to get back in and coerced to get back into their buildings. And so in, in that happening, uh, whatever was at their fingertips, that is what they were taking. And I still hear schools bragging about some of the things that they've used and I kind of cringe um, because they really need to go through an assessment to know if that was what would work for, the, for their school. Um, and, and I do want to say, uh, I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, well, I shouldn't, uh, public health is now my love. And so, um, and it was in July that we asked the governor, we asked the department, we asked uh, DHHS and DEQ to consider um, ventilation before pushing children back into these schools. And so this program, and we were thankful to the governor for, um, for bringing this program about and applying state funding for this before we knew uh, what would be in those uh, future and well now existing uh, CARES packages. But I'm just really concerned that the timing, you know, the, the money is one thing, but it's the time that it, and we knew this. When you came here and you presented last, Regina, we talked about the scarcity of professionals. And we have to keep in mind that businesses are doing this. You said that. Uh, just like in Flint with lead, businesses were taking care of their uh, situations, but our children, our children are continue to be last thought of. And the last thing that I will uh, just talk about, because uh, Regina, our paths have crossed in many spaces. And we know that we were talking, we, we, the state got sued um, because of ventilation Ill issues uh, with, with uh, Detroit students. Um, but a lot of these buildings we've been concerned about for so long. Um, many of the children who suffer the most from uh, COVID right now, the outcomes, have underlying issues. So a lot of times it's asthma. And so we have to be thinking about anything that, that's being done in these buildings, making sure that it's not counter to what it is that we're trying to do, which is to make the building safe. And so I'm really concerned about the, the, the patchwork that's being done out there because schools are trying to rush to get teachers, rush to get uh, the professionals that they need, rush to open the doors, but also having to rush to do something uh, to um, appease um, folks and make them feel as if they've done something about this ventilation in the midst of this most horrific uh, public health crisis that is born through uh, aerosols and, 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 and through the air. And so with the presentation, um, if we're going to talk about environmental justice, because we should talk about that 10%, the, the, the 10%, there was something else that you said about 67% of the schools hadn't upgraded in, or, or they had, I can't, yeah. If we could just really pull those things out, because when we're making these claims that we don't need masks, that we don't need um, uh, mitigation that all kids need to just run back to school. Uh, we're not thinking. We, I need you to be telling us and and the state what's really going on out there um, for these kids, for those teachers. Um, those are also the places where vaccines are the lowest vaccines are often 
um, is the lowest. So it, this is just a critical time. Um, and so uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the work. I, I'm talking about the program. I know the funding. I don't know if you talked about that. Is it is it running out soon? So <laughs> we just had this conversation <clears throat> the other day. We're brief, yeah. guys. We got, we got to wrap this topic yeah. up, OK? So. Technically, yes, but no. We wanted to wait and see from this conversation whether or not there was an interest to continue. Um, it has to interest, continue. We will, yeah. we will continue. Yeah. It and does have to be co continue. We've got three pandemic relief packages, all of which can support this work. You've got an infrastructure bill that's soon going to become law. That will be able to support the work. And it's going to become an increasing focus within the state that is focused on this sort of work. So I think that there's some value to that. Ms. Lipton, a quick question, please. Yes, um, being that one of the uh, planks of our top 10 um, education plan is improving the health and safety um, of, our, uh, of our students, I believe, in schools, um, I'm curious if you could offer any comment on how we as the board might measure success in that area, um, given the data that you have. Would it be... Um, coming up with some baseline and then um, suggesting uh, some increase over baseline. Um, I'm just uh, uh, curious as to your thoughts on how we as the board might view um, and how we might um, hold ourselves accountable in terms of what that metric might look like for improving um, the, uh, the health and safety of schools vis-a-vis uh, your presentation and this information. So I will start by saying that I, you know, it's hard for us to, you know, set a bar. I think the key is, is the age of these buildings and the opportunity to increase um, the safety. You know, I am the public advocate, so I'm really speaking from that vantage point. Anything technical that I say, Robert may shake his head, but from my vantage point, we really have to figure out how to keep kids safer in schools with better air quality. Even before the pandemic hit, as Dr. Q mentioned, asthma was an issue and there are others. And so I think not just prioritizing, the learning is important, but learning in a, a safe environment is important. Their health is there. So I think if there is a bar or a thought to be had, it's really about how can kids be safer in schools? I mean, this is one element, but it's not the only element, right? There are other ways that I think it can be measured. And based on just this, this kind of sample data, really, it's not even, you know, half of the schools out there. There's a lot of work to be done. So encouraging, I know we don't have control over what schools do with their buildings, but definitely can, encouraging them to make the improvements that will make kids safer, I think, should be a priority. So, so I'm going to wrap, um, and this has been a rich conversation. We, we would welcome inviting you back um, if, if we've not um, um, trampled on your good graces. Uh, we would welcome inviting you back because I think we share similar concerns um, in, this, in this area. Uh, when I began my career in public education almost 40 years ago, there were GAO, U.S. General Accounting Office, report about the deferred maintenance around this area in U.S. public schools 40 years ago. Reflect upon that. It's not gotten better in the last 40 years. It's gotten worse in the last 40 years. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that this state, in its school funding formula, does nothing associated with the capital needs of local school districts. Local school districts are left to fend for, their, for themselves completely. And if you have uh, a low or inadequate um, a taxable value or assessed value, then you are unable to raise the requisite funds through a bond or through a sinking fund. That's a real issue because the quality of the buildings that you experience is a function of where your mom or dad, grandma or grandpa actually has, has situated the family not a function of the needs of any individual child or children across the, uh, across the state. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to even that up to, to some measure, recognizing that you're dealing with inequities 
that have um, existed over decades. And while we hope that it won't take decades to address this issue, it's certainly going to take uh, years. You know, we all have an urgency around this. We all want to see this done sooner rather than later, um, much sooner rather than, than later. But we are supportive of efforts um, to uh, Dr. Pugh's point, to Ms. Lipton's point, around that third state strategic education plan goal of improving the health, safety, and wellness of our public schools. That's a big, that's a big deal for us. If the mechanical efficiency goes up, the operating costs go down, the healthfulness goes up, you're talking about three things here. General upgrades, number one, upgrades from HV to HVAC, because there are many schools that have no AC. And then you're talking about the issue of filtering or air exchange according to current code. Because, of course, you're grandfathered into the code when you, when you put in your uh, initial or last uh, mechanical system. So you are talking about an enormous amount of work in an enormous number of buildings across the state. And I'm reminded of a, uh, a question asked by a board member years ago uh, of a superintendent for whom I worked. He said, you know, what you're talking about, superintendent, could take 20 years. What do you have to say about that? And he said, I wish we had started 20 years ago. But we didn't. And the best we can do is build a better future um, rather than lament the, the miserable past. We appreciate the work that you're doing. We want to help amplify it. We want to help strengthen it. We want to get the word out to schools and school districts that these assessments are important, that they're a foot in the water um, for districts that have limped for years, not just with their mechanical systems, with, with everything else in their districts. So we want to work with you on this in whatever way or ways we can. I know you've worked with uh, Deputy Superintendent Garant and, and his team but happy to amplify that in the in the um, in the near and the the midterm future. Thank you very much for your presentation. We Thank appreciate you. it. We hope you'll come back for uh, we'll for come another. We'll come back whenever you invite us. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Board. We are 11:33. I'd like to move us, um, given the additions to the agenda, um, to the approval of the proposed standards for the preparation of elementary and secondary pre-K-12 and central office administrators. The standards for the preparation of elementary and secondary PK-12 and central office administrators were presented by the State Board of Education on January 12, 2021, and followed by public comment opportunities through May 11, 2021. These standards would replace Michigan's current administrator preparation standards today the board is being asked to approve these standards. Pending board approval, technical assistance will be provided by the Office of Educator Excellence to educator preparation institutions on program review and redesign to align to the new standards. Presenters are Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent of Educator Student and School Supports, Ms. Leah Breen, Director of the Office of Educator Excellence, Dr. Sean Kotke, Educator Consultant Manager, Office of Educator Excellence, and Dr. Gina Garner, Higher Education Consultant, Officer of Educator Excellence. Welcome presenters. Good morning, a re-good morning, depending upon uh, which of you I am talking with. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good morning to our State Board of Education. Our presentation on the standards and the approval we seek will be presented at this time. Good morning. Michigan's current administrator standards are based on our previous standards from the Educational Leadership Constituent Council. These standards were revised in 2018 to reflect current challenges school administrators face in today's schools. These revised standards were renamed the National Educational Leadership Preparation, or NELP, standards. And once those national standards revision was completed, the department determined the review of current standards was in order to assure we are using the most relevant information for the preparation of Michigan administrators. Stakeholders from Michigan schools, Michigan professional education organizations, 
preparation programs, and other interested groups from across the state, including the Upper Peninsula, gathered to consider what Michigan school administrators need to know to lead Michigan schools. Once the committee determined that the standards needed to be updated, they had two options. They could update and revi uh, write revised standards for Michigan, or they could up, uh, adopt the NELP standards as a whole. After much discussion and review, the committee decided to adopt the NELP standards as a whole and recommend that. The proposed standards place emphasis on areas of preparation that current school administrators need to be effective and successful. This includes using data to make decisions, providing instructional leadership across content areas, creating equitable schools for students, staff, and the community around those schools, and building the professional capacity of school staff. Key shifts in the standards include a focus on connecting schools with families and connecting schools with community stakeholders. It also includes an increase in the time a leader would spend in clinical experiences enacting those standards prior to certification. And finally, the responsibility for school administrators for the well-being of not only the children in a school community, but all of the adults who contribute to that community. We put these standards out for public comment and public comment was provided by 265 stakeholders from multiple perspectives, including administrators, district organizations, uh, professional organizations, preparation faculty from our preparation programs, teachers, citizens, and parents. As a result of the public comment, 88% of stakeholders providing public comment indicated that the proposed standards would improve the preparation of building level administrators. 85% noted they would improve the preparation of central office administrators. 97% of respondents indicated that these standards provide the basic elements needed for beginning building and district administrators and 90% in, uh, indicated that the central office standards provided the basic elements needed for central office administrators. The majority of comments provided support for the standards in general and for updating standards for our administrative preparation programs. Several comments of support emphasized the standards focus on ethics, equity, and cultural responsiveness as being critical for education leaders in today's schools. The internship garnered support for experience-based preparation and acknowledgement of the need for experiential learning through that internship. The internship also gained attention regarding the critical need for quality mentors. Multiple comments voiced the need for administrators to have particular content, such as supporting students in special education or English learners and attending to school finance and South family law. Comments that were not supportive of these changes focused on current systems, current administrators in the systems, and current or past preparation programs that were considered less effective. The committee was convened in May to review all of the comments and articulate responses briefly after each point of concern. After that review, the committee decided that no adjustments were needed in the standards and recommended that they be brought forward to this board for approval. If the SBE approves the adoption of these new standards, our next steps include offering technical assistance to our preparation programs with the new standards this fall and application windows that begin this November and continue through April and November of next year. Candidates would begin entering programs in fall of 2022 and our first candidates would graduate from these programs in 2024. Thank you very much, presenters. Could I have a motion to approve the new standards? Uh, I have a motion by Dr. Pritchett, a second by Dr. Pugh. Any discussion? Mr. McMillan. Thank you. Um, 
So on I'm focusing on the building level um, standards and um, standard four learning and instruction is, is this um, is incorporated in these components um, that administrators are accountable for student success, specifically reading uh, at grade level and doing math at grade level. Um, it is considered um, with that learning instruction that administrators are responsible for the student success and the success of all the adults in that building. It's not specifically pointed to in the standard as far as this administrator is responsible for. But what the standards do is provide that background that administrators need to have the skills and knowledge they need to be responsible for those students. Okay. Um, and then for standard five, um, community and external leadership, um, is there incorporated in these components um, that parents and families will be respected, their privacy, their right to be the ultimate teacher of their children, their right to have values, attitudes, and beliefs, and all of those are to be respected by school administrators? That is also embedded in between the component with the community and standard three with equity. Um, because the equity standard really looks at making sure all students and all families in a community are respected and provided access. Okay. I had a comment from a, a parent who, now I don't know, maybe the, maybe the assumptions and beliefs change because I was having a hard time finding, um, is demonstrating instructional leadership that improves student outcomes equitably. Is that in here somewhere? Is that in the... Um, that was one of our original um, frames that we provided our stakeholders, that we were looking for standards that would enable that to occur in preparation programs. Okay, because I, I didn't know if that would mean, if we're looking at student outcomes being equal, not opportunity, but actually outcomes, does that mean that it'll be used kind of as a justification to eliminate gifted and talented or accelerated education op opportunities because you got to kind of level everybody? Those kinds of district level decisions aren't really included in the preparation standard. Um, but the equity piece of it really looks at providing that access to everyone. Okay, so it's opportunity. Correct. Okay. Um, and then in the culture, um, you know, and this is I'm looking at the assumptions and beliefs. Um, Talks about school administrator pro, uh, preparation programs must ensure that students share responsibility for all students and provide diverse experiences uh, that incorporate equity, inclusiveness, and cultural responsiveness. Does the all and inclusiveness include keeping all, including you know children, whatever, regardless of the their color of skin, safe, free of shame, embarrassment, or criticized from behaviors uh, for behaviors not committed by them personally? All of those pieces are part of respecting a child's culture, no matter what that culture is when they come into the school building. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Other board members? Hearing and seeing none. Um, if we could have a roll call vote, Marilyn, please. Lipton? I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. If we could offer the public an opportunity for comment in, in advance of. Uh, are there any uh, members of the public that would like to comment on this voting item? And if there are any members of the public who are interested in voting uh, or uh, providing public comment uh, on this item, and hearing and seeing none, <coughs> uh, if we could do a roll call vote. Thank you. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Snyder? No. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. 6 2 motion carries. Okay, it is 11 45, uh, board. Thank you to our presenters. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate you. It is 11 45, board. What I'd like us to do is I'd like us to break for lunch. If we could come back at uh, 12 45, that would be great. Um, enjoy your lunches. You're, you're gonna